Thank you so much, and I'd, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for sticking with us. We are the final panel of the day, the closers. We're going to have a wide-ranging discussion, hopefully, about energy security, markets, the policy outlook, and we do not have a tremendous amount of time, so we are going to get right into it. So, all-star panel, a year ago, we were really looking at quite a horrific outlook for Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There was conversations about a potential even deindustrialization of Europe because of a major energy crisis. In terms of oil prices, people were forecasting potentially $200 a barrel oil on the back of sanctions. And yet, fast forward a year, we look at where natural gas prices are, we look at Europe's ability to build inventory, Oil prices are not in the 30s, they're in the 80s, but they are off the highs that we saw in March. And so as we think about energy security, where are we? Is, is, is the worst over? We, we heard Fatih Burrell earlier today essentially saying that next year could be challenging, but 2025 should be better with you know, LNG coming on. So for all of you, I wanna ask the question, one year into this war, how do we think about the energy security landscape? My friend, Sheikh Nawaf, I'm gonna start with you. Thanks, Halima. Uh, first of all, I, I don't see where Jason is right now, but um, big thank you to, yes. to Jason Bordoff for arranging all of this. And when Jason uh, called me and said, <laughs> when Jason called me and said, uh, I'd like you to come to this uh, from Kuwait to, to New York just for this event, I said, absolutely for Jason, I will do it. Uh, the response to your question, Halima, it's a year on into this, uh, into this new uh, world. We're actually no different than we were before. Um, the way I, I look at it, I'm looking at it from a, an oil uh, market's perspective, uh, more so than perhaps the gas perspective. But from the oil market's perspective, uh, we still, we're back at about 100 million barrels a day of, of demand, 100 million barrels uh, a day of supply. We're relatively balanced in that, uh, in that perspective. Uh, you've seen uh, what uh, oil producers have done over the past uh, year to uh, maintain that balance as much as possible. When, it, when the market needed more oil, it was provided. And when it looked like uh, that uh, the market needed sort of anticipatory uh, actions, uh, those were taken as well. So you have a relative balance in that market. Now, the, from an energy security point of view, we're still worried, and I'm still extremely worried about the lack of spare capacity that we see around the world. Uh, and that's a, the result of the massive underinvestment that's happened over the past seven years. So we're not there yet, and, and we're seeing also new investments in production capacity really just being made in the, in the core uh, OPEC uh, GCC countries. Yeah. No, I think that's a, it's been a theme throughout the day and it's been something that people debate a lot in the market is, you know, how serious is this under investment challenge and what is it gonna mean for prices over the next, you know, three to five years? And Vicki Holov, Scott Sheffield, I mean, there's been a lot of question about what is the outlook for US production? Have we seen sort of peak Permian? Is it simply, the investment issue, is it supply chain issues? Like, how do we think about U.S. production over the next three to five years? I think certainly we have not seen yet uh, peak production from Permian. Permian is the, I think, the most prolific basin in all of the world with respect to shale. Um, and I think that while other basins in the U.S. Uh, may be plateauing, uh, I think the Permian will continue to increase and will be able to, over time, offset the, the decline from the other basins as they start to decline. So I think that the Permian production will remain healthy. Um, I think that uh, certainly the U.S. production, which had one time it peaked at around 13 million barrels a day, I think we do have the capability to potentially get there, if not this year, next year. Scott Sheffield, you were out earlier this year talking about a tighter market, and. We've, we've lifted peak Permian from you as a, as a quote. I mean, how, how are you thinking about this? I'm gonna go back to expand on what uh, Nala said about underinvestment. We've underinvested $1 trillion in upstream since 2015. So that gives you an idea of the reasons why. Uh, we've had two downturns in late 14 and early 2020. Uh, ESG, a lot of people are reallocating capital toward ESG. 
um, and then um, obviously uh, uh, the uh, lower uh, lower price. Uh, and so that under and and lastly the capital framework change that the U.S. Independent made. So instead of providing two percent return on capital employed to our shareholders like we did for ten years. Uh, we changed the framework, and that took a lot of investment inside the U.S. I'm like Vicky. The Permian is the only growing oil shell basin uh, in regard in the U.S. Uh, the rest of the oil shells are flat to declining, and will continue to do that. Um, and so we were already going to get into a tight market, in my opinion, even before the situation a year ago. Most people were predicting 24, 25, a very tight market, even before what happened a year ago between Russia and Ukraine. So we are not done with $100 oil. Do you think we will hit that point this year? I think we'll touch $100. We're only $13 away. It's a question whether or not it breaks through 90. If it breaks through 90, it's at 87 today. It'll run toward 100, in my opinion. And we'll see something between 90 to 100 for a while. Sure, if we were together in Saudi Arabia one week before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we actually had, you know, oil prices 90 at that point. And so as you look back on this year, I mean, you obviously are telling the gas story, but we heard earlier that it should be okay by 2025. I mean, how are you thinking about Europe's ability for winter? and then years going forward. I think we're okay like the proverbial frog. She was sitting in the water before the water started boiling, and when the, start bo when the water started boiling, she thought she was still okay. Uh, there's nothing okay but what's going to happen. In 25, uh, Qatar will not have brought their new trains on yet. They will start in 26, 27, and 28. In the United States, we have 40 million tons that are supposed to arrive somewhere in the 25, 26, 27 time frame that is currently under construction, and that represents about 80% of the world. So uh, when you've lost 15 BCF a day of gas deliveries by pipeline in Europe, when the fields are declining in Asia, uh, representing the equivalent of about 40 or 50 million tons. We are going to need, in that time frame, about 200 million tons just to stay in place. And that is not going to happen. So 25 is not going to be good, 26 is not going to be good, 27 is not going to be good. And uh, it all depends on the investment that are decided today to figure out where 27, 28, 29 may, might improve a little bit. We are going to be in a highly volatile situation because the storage on a global basis is in Europe. And if you store in Europe, you mitigate the risk. If you don't store in Europe, you're really in a very difficult situation. So it, it is not going to be smooth. From time to time, it'll feel like we're doing okay. But Patrick said earlier today, uh, prices in Europe today are $15 in MMBTU, and they consider that good. Well, two years ago, they would have considered that a disaster. So this is where we are today. It's not good for the next decade. And I, I want to just as a follow on for that, I mean, given where natural gas prices are now, what is going to be the impact for those investment decisions based on the sort of lower price environment we're in right now? I think um, the fundamentals are telling you you should invest. But the business model to invest that much money in infrastructure at the moment doesn't exist. So if you look at all the things you need to do simply beyond the upstream investments that are required, if you need the liquefaction facilities, the ships, the receiving facilities, uh, the ability of building pipelines from wherever the supply is to the, to, to, to the coastal areas to put it on the water, and or if you need to do very long pipelines, uh, all these investments are infrastructure investments that, generally speaking, the actors in the business don't like doing. This is not their strong point. They like to do, they like to drill wells and produce well. And they are sometimes in the downstream and they like their refineries. But they don't like the infrastructure investment. And so they are not inclined by nature to do so. And the companies that do so today don't have the means to do it. The utilities on a global basis 
don't have the ability to build it. So at the moment we're looking, I mean, <laughs> I was talking about earlier, said, I've heard all day today, we are going to invest in this, and we are going to invest in that, and we are going to do this. Would somebody be, please tell me who we is? <laughs> because uh, I know what Vicky's going to yes. invest in. <laughs> you? <laughs> Can we talk after the meeting? <laughs> So shaking up, I'm actually going to bring it back to you because we have national companies. You're the representative on the stage, and who has made the biggest profits from you know, the rise in oil prices? National companies. And so the question is, are we looking at a landscape where the national companies are going to be almost the last one standing because of the low emissions, low cost, willingness to invest? Uh, precisely because of all of those. And you know, right now, because we are the lowest cost barrel in the world. We're also the lowest carbon intensity barrel in the world. Uh, we are con going to continue to invest to maintain both of those positions. After 85 years of producing oil and gas in Kuwait, uh, our fields are starting to age and we're gonna need uh, additional energy to produce the same barrels of oil that we're producing right now. So the, the challenge for us is how to produce those barrels in an environmentally uh, friendly manner. We're making those investments through uh, uh, using solar for, for, to power our, our uh, uh, facilities, through uh, using uh, CO2 that would be otherwise uh, dissipated into the atmosphere to use it as enhanced oil recovery techniques. We're doing all that because we will remain uh, if, you say, if you say the last barrel standing, I usually just say the last barrel on earth will be produced from our region. And that's because throughout this energy transition, there, however large the pie for energy grows, there will always be a wedge for oil. Uh, we will invest to make sure that our oil is the one that is produced in, in that wedge. Uh, and, and you find that only really in responsible uh, producers like KPC who will make investments of billions of dollars for spare, to, to maintain spare capacity that ultimately may not be used right now but, may be, but will be used uh, and it, it, during supply disruptions or as needed. Well, since you opened the door on spare capacity, I, I have to go there on, on the OPEC question. We've seen first the big OPEC cut in October, two million barrels. We just had what has been described, not a surprise to you, as the OPEC cut on Sunday, the 1.6 collective OPEC plus. How do we think about that in terms of market management, about building back spare capacity, you know, potentially providing the price incentive needed by other producers around the world? Like, How should we think about, from your standpoint, that production decision? I think it's be, it, the best description of that is uh, producers res uh, acting responsibly. Uh, what happened? Uh, in October was, and I used this in my initial remark went on, on anticipatory actions. This was an anticipatory action by uh, OPEC and OPEC Plus, uh, looking at what was expected to happen on softness in, in terms of demand during the, during the uh, period after October. The doom and gloom prognostications of what might happen, you'll end up with uh, $100 oil very quickly and, and, and beyond that did not materialize precisely because OPEC was right that there was a, a softness that, was, that materialized over time, so that production cut actually maintained the balance. The, the, the idea for, for all of these, was, uh, these actions was to maintain a balance between supply and demand and keep the market as, as stable as possible. So that was that. Over the, over the last week as well, there was uh, continued concern, not so much, uh, from my perspective, not so much as on, on you know, Chinese demand, because I see that really as, as, as uh, quite strong and, and robust, but uh, demand in other places around the world. And by the same token, our position with our customers has always been, when you grow, we grow with you. We are business partners together. We have been uh, in this relationship for decades. Uh, so this isn't a one-off transaction where we try to make a, uh, a quick profit over something and, and then lose a uh, business partner that we've developed for, for decades. We do this uh, so that we can maintain the demand 
uh, that, uh, that they continue to, to exhibit, and also for us to supply and provide a, a fair return to uh, our shareholder, essentially, uh, a fair rent on the natural resource of, of, of the state. Now this morning we had Secretary Granholm here, and this question is for both Vicky and Scott. There has been so much discussion in the financial media about the relationship between the Biden administration and the U.S. oil and gas industry, and about what is perceived as a, a difficult relationship. And if I could ask you, what are you concretely looking for from the administration when it comes to energy policy? Is it permitting, infrastructure? Like, what is the nature of the ask of the administration? Well, I think there's, um, there's a lot that we need from the administration. Um, first of all, though, I'd say that um, Secretary Granholm has come to Sarah Week three years in a row, and you can tell that over the three years, uh, she's really gotten into the uh, details of what it's gonna take to, for us to be successful as, as a country and to do the things that we need to do to ensure that we do have energy security over time. And uh, she clearly said this morning that permitting is one of the things that's top of the agenda for, um, for the Department of Energy and for uh, the President. Uh, and I am fully on board with President Biden's uh, goals and his ambitions around what our emission reduction should be in the United States. So there's a lot of common ground here. And uh, the enthusiasm that Secretary Granholm brings to new technologies, that's what it's going to take for us to, to achieve the goals that we need to achieve as a country. So having those, um, the commitment to technologies, uh, leveraging um, her department, enhancing the, um, uh, her staff, and getting it structured so that we could implement the, the benefits of the IRA bill is critically important, because otherwise we would be very, very much slowed down. So she understands what it takes to get it done. She's taken the measures to, to do it. Uh, I think that's a positive for all of us. Um, I think that the, the thing that's lacking now is the permitting, well permitting on federal lands. And uh, I think that process is taking way too long. And I think the other thing that, uh, that needs a review is the class six wells that's gonna be required for uh, sequestration. Uh, those are, and that's again, well permitting. So those things have to happen, they have to happen faster and we can't let other uh, auxiliary permitting issues slow down the, uh, the drilling process either. And so there's a lot of things around permitting that I think uh, both sides of the aisle agree needs to be improved. We just gotta make it happen. Scott? <clears throat> I'll, pro I'll probably be a little bit harder than Vicki was. Uh, but if you, if you go back two years ago, they wanted to ban um, fracking, wanted to ban all drilling on all federal leases. Um, and I don't think the mindset's changed. I mean, at least we got mentioned that will last another 10 years in the um, State of the Union speech by the president. Um, so I don't think the mindset has changed a lot. Um, I think they realize they have, they need us now because of what happened in Ukraine. If it wasn't for Ukraine, I still think they generally want to um, stop all fossil fuels, in my general opinion. Uh, and so we, we need an administration that will accept all forms of energy. I've stated and I've testified we need nuclear, we need alternative energy, wind and solar, and we need hydrocarbons. Uh, we need all, and we need an administration that supports all of those and the infrastructure that we need to implement all of those across the board. Sharif, I have to go to you on natural gas. When the administration came in, there was a question about the role of natural gas in the transition. Is it a transition fuel? Is it a fossil fuel that needs to stay in the ground? Do you think the war in Ukraine has settled the role of natural gas in the transition? Well, first, I thought it was settled five years ago. <laughs> and uh, five years ago, I was told that I was green. And then four years ago, I was told, no, I was brown. So uh, it, it's confusing. I feel like a chameleon. Uh, I keep changing colors all the time. But right now, we're back in a set where, yes, because of the invasion of the Ukraine, we're sitting in a situation where natural gas is absolutely needed. Unfortunately, it took, before the invasion of Ukraine, very high prices in Europe to start triggering a realization that we were short natural gas on a global basis. And when Europe started hurting, and there were 
uh, warnings of potentially very cold people were actually, Tom Friedman coined the sentence, uh, eat or heat, where England was having to make a choice between those two. And it took that issue to arrive to Europe for people to take consciousness and say, okay, there's a problem. And that's when Europe started uh, becoming, uh, putting in question the, their assumptions and saying, okay, if we've confronted with civil unrest in Europe because we have to make choices that are very difficult, do we need to reconsider what natural gas is gonna be and what role it's going to play in, this, in, in, in the energy future? And then, the Ukraine happened and everything got compounded. So right now, yes, we have a period of uh, uh, honeymoon, if you will. We'll, let's see how long it lasts. So, so switching gears, I wanna talk about the, the technologies and the investment that will be needed for the, the key transition um, technologies and fuels. And Vicky, there has been a lot written. There was a Wall Street Journal profile of you, of your decision to make the big investment and direct air capture. Can you sort of walk us through you know, how you made that decision, how you think about this technology becoming commercially viable, you know, how important has the IRA been for this technology? Well, we have been working on trying to get anthropogenic or atmospheric CO2 to the Permian, more of it, um, over the past 12 years. So this is not something that just came up a few years ago. We've been working this strategy for a very long time. And we tried for, for years to talk to industry about capturing anthropogenic CO2, but we were having those conversations at a time when emissions weren't uh, top of mind for, for hardly anybody. So we, um, we then came across the, some technology that carbon engineering had developed and realized that the direct air capture was the pathway where we were able to control our own destiny, build those anywhere we wanted to, uh, any time we wanted to and uh, at the volume that we needed. So we latched onto that technology to ensure that, that we have the capability to get more oil out of our reservoirs. And as Fatty Baral had said earlier, the part of the key to the climate transition is ensuring that you produce the lowest carbon intensity barrels possible. And in fact, with atmospheric uh, CO2, or anthropogenic CO2, it's, it's actually possible to produce a carbon neutral barrel of oil or a carbon negative barrel of oil, depending on the efficiency of the CO2 in the reservoir. So that's not, that's not greenwashing. It's, and it's, while some environmentalists think that it provides us the capability just to continue to produce more oil, demand around the world will be what it is, demand. We don't control demand. If we could, we would try to help uh, people realize that conservation should be a part of the discussion too, and trying to minimize the, uh, the hydrocarbons that, that we need to use. And there's not a lot of that happening around the world right now. So this gave us the capability to, with our conventional reservoirs in the Permian, we can get up to 70% of the oil in the ground, whereas with primary from those same reservoirs, primary and water flooding, we were only getting 40% or less. Um, in the shale play, which the U.S. now has a lot of, we can increase our production, our recovery from 10% to potentially almost double. It, at least we've tested it to 18% recovery. So, so the reality is that not only does this enable us to produce lower carbon barrels um, that can be used in aviation and um, in maritime, and these are the same as what you, as what you would call uh, sustainable aviation fluid. This is actually better in our view because it's cheaper, it will be more abundant, and it's, uh, and it's essentially the same sort of emissions, um, which we offset with the initial injection of the CO2. So it's the right thing to do for the climate transition because otherwise the models I've seen, the world cannot afford the transition that most people think needs to happen, uh, it just, just can't afford it. So we have to use this technology. Another technology we're using is net power where, or that we, we've invested in, we're developing, we'll build the first one of these um, in the Permian here in the next couple of years. We're building direct air capture today. Um, and it will be the largest direct air capture facility to be built in the world when we get it online. It'll, it'll extract 500,000 tons per, uh, per year from the atmosphere. Also it requires, um, 
uh, emission-free power, uh, which uh, that power, which I was about to describe, combusts hydrocarbon gases with oxygen, which uh, instead of air, which eliminates the volatile organic uh, compound emissions and captures the CO2 as a part of the process. The CO2 drives the turbine, so capturing that CO2, it can then be used in uh, oil reservoirs as well. And just a follow on in terms of like financing this and you know bringing down costs, like how essential is, is carbon credits to making this commercially viable? Carbon credits, credits are important because actually the, what, what um, solidified our decision to do this was when uh, Senator Heidi Heidkamp got, got 45Q enhanced previously. It was her capability and ability to do that that gave us our final investment decision to build direct air capture but the IRA, what it has done for us is give us the capability, the revenue certainty, so that we can actually accelerate the number of these that we'll build um, in the, uh, around the world. So now, instead of building 70 between now and 2035, we expect we'll be able to build over 100 of these. And that is significant when you think about the fact that, um, that for every 1 million tons of CO2 that you take out of the atmosphere, that's the equivalent of taking 400,000 cars off the road. Scott, I want to follow up with you because you've talked a lot about, you know, the need to move, you know, aggressively on methane reduction. And so my question to you is on technology in terms of, you know, which technologies are you most excited about and what's the role for mandates and taxes to deal with methane? To me. You, that's for you. Okay. Uh, when I came back four years ago, I saw how much the Permian Basin was flaring and I couldn't believe it. Uh, I've been educated by Jason and his staff, Fred Krupp, EDF, over the last 10 years about how potent methane is. And so uh, we started publishing everybody's, we got it from Reistat, and we had a lot of people call us and tell us to pull it down. We started publishing four years ago everybody's um, flaring intensity across the board, majors, independents. And uh, we published it for about six months, then we pulled it down. And it's amazing what's happened over the last four years. I mean, we started, we're the first one to start with fly, flyovers. It's low level, uh, infrared, uh, 3,000 feet. Uh, satellites only pinpoint one point in time and very, they can't get small volumes. Uh, flyovers was the next thing, and then I think what needs to be mandated is surface sensors. By this summer, we'll have all of our horizontal batteries installed with surface sensors, so you need to monitor any gas leaks uh, 24 hours a day, just like we do oil leaks in the oil field, and then go out and fix them immediately. So we've seen flaring come down uh, from about a BCF a day to about 250 million a day. We're still working on the private producers. The private producers are probably one of the bigger problems. And also some of the midstream, um, smaller finance, private equity, midstream producers. So I think the problem's gonna be solved. Uh, several of us, I think Vicki has joined too, OGMP. Uh, so we're committed to reducing uh, flaring intensity down to two tenths, uh, 1% by 2025. So we need to get more people to join it. But th those are some of the things th the industry is doing. And we're, we've been very supportive of all the EPA rules that have, been, have come out and that are coming out in this next round. So we have had a number of questions come in, and so I'm gonna take some of these together because we have so little time left. But one of the questions is, like, what is responsible, or who is responsible for the current lack of investment, the, you know, the mood of capital discipline? Is it government policy or a poor return on investment? Let's take that question. Poor, poor vision. Okay, let's go. Yes. I'll, I'll start with that. Poor vision, I think. In, in 2015, as, as we were talking about it a little bit earlier, um, when the oil price collapsed, there was this massive amount of investment. I think, Scott, you said it was about a trillion dollars? One trillion since then. Yeah. Oh, so a trillion dollars since then. And the, the world used to discover about six billion barrels of oil uh, per year. Uh, after that, with expiration dry, budgets completely dried up, uh, it was discovering less than a third of that. Now, when you add the, the period of time that it takes up, up until now, that's, you, you're seeing where that production should have been materializing right now, and it didn't. The people were 
scared of what prices would look like. There was this uh, fear that uh, the, at that point, the energy transition had not been, had not picked up as much as it has today, but, but there was a fear of, of where demand was going uh, with oil, and uh, there was this abundance of supply that was coming from shale and coming from uh, the, the Permian and other places in, 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 in Texas. We kept saying throughout that process, no, we're gonna need every single barrel. We're gonna need every single barrel that can be produced because demand will continue to be strong and continue to increase. There is no replacement uh, for, for oil. We have to work on decarbonizing the oil that we're producing, but we're not gonna be able to replace it completely. And it's the, the concern as well then from, from the ESG perspective, people not being able to find, find financing. We in Kuwait, uh, are doing it anyway. We're going through, because, uh, through the, 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 the investment cycle because we look at it as an NOC completely differently than, than the international oil companies because we are long on oil. We will continue to produce for decades to come and we'll make it net zero. Now, this is a, oh, Sharif, if you're jumping in on this. My view is the US shale revolution is guilty because in about 12 years ago, all of a sudden we cracked the code and we turned the United States from one of the major importers of hydrocarbons in the world to one of the energy superpowers of the world. And in that process, what we did is what Scott was talking about. The returns on investment were 2%. And all of a sudden, people started thinking, making an investment in energy is not a winning combination. So slowly, the institutions started saying, we don't want to be touching that thing, that sector. We went from something like 14, 15%, God correct me if I'm wrong, you're better 15. on numbers than I yeah. am, uh, of the S&P 500 to 3% at the low. And that drop convinced most people not to invest in the energy business. And that lasted for 10 to 12 years. So the underinvestment came because of the bad performance. The bad performance came because we took the largest importer and turned it into a very, very significant exporter. That's over. Now the world is caught up and we're back to, we need the investments, but we have not come to grips with that reality. So we're now sitting in a situation where we need to go back to the investments of the pre-shale revolution and those levels, and probably a lot more. And the flow of funds is now changes, changed. For a decade, there was a trillion dollars a year of transfer of wealth from producing countries to consuming countries. Everybody was running to Beijing and Singapore to get investments. Now they're going. That has now reversed itself. And people who need to figure out where the investment is gonna come from is gonna need to think about the Gulf countries and Norway. What do they want to do with the money that they're now accumulating? That is a great segue into a set of questions I got even before I got on the stage was about the relationship between the United States and the Gulf. And Sharif, you set this up so well with the fact that you now have asset managers now making regular trips to Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait. There has been a lot about discussion about poor relations between the US and certain Gulf countries. The OPEC cut in October, we saw a lot of renewed tensions publicly displayed. But yet we have partnership on clean energy if we look at that, the PACE program that was in the US and UAE. Sheikh Nawaf, you sit in Kuwait, you are, you spend so much time in the United States. How do you think about the relationship from Kuwait's perspective? Uh, the relationship between Kuwait and the United States is extremely strong. Um, I think it's different for us. We bled together in a war. We, uh, we fought together. We, uh, our, our liberation in, in uh, 1991 uh, was due in large measure to the uh, United States and the, the World Coalition that, that uh, came to our defense. So there is a strong relationship on a security pr perspective. Uh, uh, by the flip side of that, remember when uh, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan, pulled the final troops out of Afghanistan, that could not have been accomplished without uh, the assistance of, the, of Kuwait uh, and Qatar and, and a few other uh, countries in the Gulf uh, who opened up their countries to receive uh, U.S. troops and, and, and uh, people coming out of Afghanistan. So that relationship is, is extremely strong. 
on an economic perspective as well, uh, the investments that we have uh, in the United States and together with, with, uh, uh, with the US, with, with um, uh, companies uh, working in, in, in the Gulf is also extremely strong. Uh, if there are differences in, of, of opinion along the way, that's perfectly natural in a, in a, in a uh, relationship that has extended for decades and uh, is based on uh, trust. Vicky, you spend a lot of time in the Gulf. I've actually been at certain big international conferences where it's almost been like you have had to wear the Occidental CEO cap, but also talk about US policy in the region. So as someone who spends a lot of time in the Gulf, how do you think about the US relationship with this incredibly important producer region? Well, with the exception of Kuwait, and I, I know you understand that relationship better, I, I'm disappointed with this administration as well as the prior two administrations. I think they have not valued the Middle East as much as, as they should. I think it's important that we maintain a great relationship with the Middle East, and it just hasn't happened over the, this administration and the prior two. And I think a degrading relationship is, puts us um, as a country uh, at risk down the road. I, I think the relationship needs to be strengthened, and I think if you look at how the U.S. corporations work with, uh, with countries in the Middle East, it's a, it's a great relationship. We, we have strong relationships with not only the, the companies we work, work with over there, Adnoc and Oman Oil, um, but we also have great relationships with the governments, and I, and I think there's just been not as much effort and uh, emphasis put on uh, maintaining a, a much healthier and, and consistent relationship. We are now down to the, the final minute of this panel, and we're going to be bringing this whole conference to a close, and I want to steal a question from the always fantastic Jason Bordoff. This is the 10-year anniversary of the Columbia University you know, Global Energy Center, the summit. Ah, 10 years from now, where do you see your companies? And if you don't achieve that, you know, what, what, is, what is the biggest risk to your aspirations for your companies? So down the line, shake no off. Okay, from my perspective, 10 years from now, we will have increased our production capacity uh, up to uh, approaching 4 million barrels a day from our current uh, number of just under 3 million. That means we are, we are maximizing the ability to produce uh, hydrocarbons from, uh, from Kuwait. But also we will be doing that in an environmentally sustainable uh, fashion. So keeping ourselves at the low end of that carbon intensity curve, by, by just a token, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, a month ago we were at CIRA week and uh, CEO of one of the IOCs at the time uh, was very proud that his Permian production, and Scott, I don't know what your carbon intensity of your barrel is in the Permian, but he was talking about 13 to 15 uh, kilograms per barrel of CO2 production. He said that's extremely low compared to the rest of his production, which was up into the 40s and yeah. 50s. Well, Kuwait is a quarter of that 13. So we want to maintain that position, and we want to go further down to zero. So we will be moving through, uh, through that. We the type of technology that Vicky was talking about, which is in the CO2 injection, to stimulate uh, production. So we will be producing more and doing it in a better environmentally sustainable fashion. Vicki? In 10 years, I expect that Oxy will be producing more oil than it is today. Don't have a number for you, but um, we will continue to grow our production. We'll grow it through the use of the CO2 that we'll extract out of the atmosphere and anthropogenic CO2 as well. We'll be not only using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, um, which again has to happen, but we'll also be using, um, sequestering some CO2 for, for our customers that and clients that want that sequestration and, and don't want to have CO2 used in the reservoir. So our, our CO2 business and the technologies that we have in our low carbon business will be a much bigger part of our revenue, earnings, and cash flow, and I think it'll be equal to our chemicals business within uh, about 10 years. The, uh, the other technologies that we have that will support that is not just direct air capture, it's lithium extraction from geothermal water, and it's the net power, it's um, uh, converting uh, CO2 into bioethylene to help support the um, products that our chemicals business will produce. Scott, 10 years from now? 10 years from now, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I won't ask on it. No, I won't. 
uh, we pulled back our uh, growth target several years ago when I came back, but you know, we, when you grow 5% a year, you're at 700,000 barrels a day today. Uh, we all will be over a million barrels of oil equivalent per day. I want Vicky's CO2 DAC project to work because I was trained at Amico. She has all my um, CO2 floods that I worked with Amico uh, through Altura. And so uh, we've done some wet gas uh, enhanced recovery projects and it is working. I'd rather use CO2 because I think it'll do a better job than wet gas. Um, and so we hope to have enhanced recovery be able to take. We're, most people don't realize we're working in a field that was discovered in 1945. And it's been going on for 80 years. Um, and technology comes along and keeps pushing the fields out. Mm -hmm. And so I think the Permian Basin is going to be there for another 50 years. Sharif, final word. We'll be an American global gas company producing 50 million tons of LNG, and we will have planted a billion trees. So I hope I get the distinct pleasure of being back here in 10 years to see where we are. And with that, I will bring this session to a close and hand it back to our MC, Melissa.